uh, uh, better. Good morning. That is a whole lot better. It is good to see everybody out with us today. It is a beautiful day, especially the last few days. It's been cloudy, it's been cool, and uh, rain's been spitting throughout the day, but it is absolutely gorgeous today. And it is always gorgeous when we have an opportunity to come together as uh, children of God to worship Him on occasions like this. And so we welcome everyone into our assembly today. Uh, thankful that you're joining us. If you're a guest of ours, thank you so much for uh, coming our way today. Before we get started, I want to make mention of a couple of things. We uh, were able to uh, see uh, and witness uh, some really good things this last week. Among them, on Thursday, Catherine Hill was baptized into Christ. Uh, Miss Catherine is Carla Bailey's mother, uh, a good friend of the Burkhalter family, and Bo had been studying with Miss Catherine for some time uh, now, and she was ready to be baptized into Christ this week, and we're so thankful for her. Uh, she is not with us this morning. She is uh, part of our crowd who uh, attends with us virtually, and uh, being that we mentioned that, I also want to segue into something else this morning. Uh, for whatever reason, our internet upstairs uh, that we use to stream our services this morning is down, and so that will not affect any of us in the assembly today, but if you are normally uh, joining us online at 10 a.m. to worship with us, uh, you're not able to do that this morning, and so uh, the folks upstairs, and we appreciate their uh, hard, uh, devoted work this morning, uh, they're trying to make that available, and so at some point later in the day, they'll have that posted to our YouTube channel, and and you'll be able to have that opportunity to worship with us. We apologize for the convenience, uh, but we appreciate you being patient with us during this time. As we worship today, uh, Brother Zane's going to be leading our singing. I want to encourage everyone to go ahead and be standing as we begin our worship to our Heavenly Father. I was looking at the sheet. I saw prayer first. All right, we'll sing, We Praise Thee, O God. Mm -hmm. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, by the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory. Revive us again. Would you pray with me, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had to come and study another portion of thy word. Lord, we are so thankful for everything that you have given us. We know that everything comes through you and from you. 
We know that we are so undeserving of anything that we're given. Lord, we just pray that you will continue to bless us and look over us. And Lord, we just ask that you be with the ones that have lost loved ones. We ask you to be with the ones that are sick. Lord, we just pray that you will put your hand on them and heal them and bring them back to a, to a normal walk of life. Lord, we just thank you so much for our teachers. Lord, uh, they teach us, they teach our children, our grandchildren. We're just so fortunate to have them a part of our lives. Lord, we just ask that you be with the military and their families. We pray that you be with the first responders and their families. Families, Lord, we just pray for our country, Lord, and the leaders of our country. Lord, we know that we are fortunate to be living in this world. And Lord, we just pray that our leaders make the right decisions and they look towards you. And Lord, we just continue to ask that you keep forgiving us of all the sins that we, we have each and every day. We just ask that you be with us guide us, and go with us through this service. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Next song's going to be all in all. I don't recall this ever. In the 10 years, I guess, I've been here, or however long it's been now, I don't recall us ever singing this song. It's not a new song, um, but we'll all start together, and then uh, as we sing it again, the... Uh, Men will sing the chorus and the ladies will sing the verse. So sing it together. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my hope in all. Seeking you has a precious jewel, Lord, to give. Be a fool, you are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy. Before, as we prepare our minds and start to think about 
Christ and the sacrifice that he made for us when we start to focus our minds on the cross. Let's sing Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There are precious fountains free. Take the Lord's Supper this morning. I want to read from Mark chapter 15, verses 15 through 20. Mark 15, verses 15 through 20. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the government governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, twisting together a crown of thorns they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his purple cloak, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. I think sometimes it's easy for us to uh, read a verse like that and think what a horrible situation that was, and those horrible people making horrible decisions and things like that, but uh, if you really reflect on the situation and what is going on and what that means to us, we are individually, each one of us, every one of us are those who are spitting on Jesus, striking him with a reed, mocking him, scourging him, driving nails through his hands and through his feet. That 
Each, we are those people. That's what, that's what our sins have done. While we were yet sinners, he went to the cross for each one of us. So as we partake of the bread this morning and reflect on his body and what it means, consider what, what we did to put him there and keep him there. If you would please bow with me. Heavenly Father, as we gather around the table this morning, the first day of the week, to remember the sacrifice that your son made for each one of us, Lord, we are so thankful for your willingness to send him for your plan, for our redemption. We're so thankful for his willingness to come and to be mocked and beaten and ultimately killed for each one of us, Lord. We're so thankful for that willingness to die for our sins. We're thankful for the avenue of prayer that he has provided for us. As we partake of this bread, Lord, help us to remove our all the thoughts and concerns and worries that occupy our minds. May we remove all of those things, Lord, and concentrate solely on his sacrifice and what he did for us. It's through his name that we pray. Amen. Would you bow with me again, please? Heavenly Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, Lord, the, we, we recognize that it represents the, the blood of our Savior, the blood of your Son that you gave for us, Lord. We, we realize that this, this emblem represents that that washes us clean, removes all spot and stain from our bodies, Lord. We are so thankful for that sacrifice. It's through Christ's name that we pray. Amen. At this time, we will say a prayer for the contribution for the for our giving back. For, for our many blessings that we've received. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are so richly blessed. We are mindful of that at this time as we purpose in our heart to give back to you, Lord. At, at this time, we, we consider the blessings that we have too numerous to count, Lord. I know in the, in the upcoming weeks, our brother Alan will be traveling to Africa. Many of our number have been there, Lord. Only those who have lived, lived or been outside of this country can truly appreciate how, how much we take for granted each and every single day, Lord. As Alan travels there, we pray that his work there will be rich for those of the communities in Africa that he, that he reaches, Lord. And we pray that the work that is going on there will be truly valuable to you, that you could bring many, many thousands of souls to be saved, Lord. We, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be able to go. We pray that our blessings, Lord, can be, can be used to reach souls all over the world, including here in Northport. We pray that as we give back to you, Lord, that we will examine how blessed we are, Lord, and give to you an amount that is, that is pleasing to you, Lord, and is both sacrificial and, and liberal, Lord. We're so thankful for all that you do, and we pray that this blessing will, will be used in the best way to, to further your kingdom. It's through Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll just be standing and we'll sing the great Redeemer. <laughs> How I love the great Redeemer who is doing so much for me. With what joy I tell the story of the love that makes men free. Till my Great things. 
to me, to me, he is everything to me, and everything shall always be. It is that time again during uh, this season of the year that we are very accustomed to people going around in costumes. If you are on Facebook, you have probably seen this past week uh, folks going to school and work and other places, and they have donned different types of costumes. We've seen everything earlier in the week, and we'll see it later today even. We've seen costumes that have to do with superheroes, then the super villains, there's television characters, movie characters, uh, all types of individuals dress up in all different types of way for uh, Halloween and, and this time of the year for parties and such. You now, as we think about what all of them have in, con uh, in, in common, whether you're that superhero or that TV character, no matter what it is, there's, there's a common thread that runs through people wearing costumes, and that is the, the person that you see on the outside is not really corresponding with the person inside. What you see uh, looking visually at someone isn't really who someone is. They're, they're pretending to be someone. And as we, we think about that idea this morning, it's that concept that we're going to be talking about when we talk about the subject of hypocrisy. Biblically speaking, it, it is the idea that says the outside, what people see, it does not match the inside. Many times we, we see the word hypocrite or hypocrites used in Jesus' language in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He directed that to different groups of people in his society. But it was the idea that, that said what you pretend to be outwardly, if you will, doesn't really match up with what is seen inwardly. Jesus had a lot to say about the idea of hypocrisy. Uh, the New Testament writers would talk about the concept of hypocrisy, and one of the things that we would learn about hypocrisy from the pages of Scripture is that when it comes to service to God, there have always been hypocrites. There have always been those who were pretenders, those who would seem to be faithful children of God in whatever dispensation of life and law that they followed, but inwardly they were not true believers. They were not individuals who were pleasing to God. 
There were hypocrites, if you will, going back to the first century in the church. There were those who were pretenders. And the church today is not immune to this. We can find hypocrisy among ourselves today. And it may be that even in our own lives, we may, if we're very honest with who we are, we may find some hypocrisy from time to time. And so for a few moments today, understanding that this is an issue that we struggle with today, it's an issue that's been prevalent among God's people for many years, I want us to talk about some common forms of hypocrisy today. A lot of the things that people were guilty of being hypocritical about in the pages of Scripture and the Gospel accounts, for instance, may not be seen as much today as it was then in the same type of forms. And so today, when we talk about hypocrisy being in the church and maybe even being in our own lives, I want us to talk about practically some, some ways that this is seen and some manifestations of that. And so let's begin this morning with our three ideas that we're going to discuss by mentioning the fact that hypocrisy is going to be seen in our life when we preach one thing, but we practice another. There's a, an account that goes like this. Uh, years ago, it was in the early 90s, there was a big meeting of many different health experts across the United States. It was over in Atlanta, Georgia, this meeting was. Among the things on the docket, the agenda that week was, does a low-fat diet help individuals stay at a good, healthy weight? In other words, if we will eat a low-fat diet, will it help us be healthier, physically speaking? The consensus of that topic when it came up for discussion and it was mattered about and discussed uh, when, when it was it is routinely looked at from all sides, the consensus was absolutely, if you eat a low-fat diet, then you're going to be healthier in life. There's only one problem, however, from that particular conference. <laughs> when they would eat lunch and, and they would eat breakfast, guess what kind of items that they would be eating? <laughs> You guessed it. Not things that were low in content of fat, but instead high-fat foods. And there was someone that observed that during that time, and, and, and one individual was asked, don't you think you're being a, a bit hypocritical? And the individual said, not at all. I just took my badge off. <laughs> you, you know, it, hypocrisy, when it comes to this idea, is rampant in the world. I imagine maybe politicians are the worst at this. It never ceases to fail. You, you've got an individual who's a politician that's roundly criticizing another politician for doing or saying something, but yet when the tables are turned and they're in that same situation, guess what they do? The very same thing. Hypocrisy when it comes to preaching one thing but practicing another, it is a major issue in our world today. And it's a major issue among Christians. Always has been, always will be. Jesus talked about the Pharisees and scribes many times in his teachings. In Matthew chapter 23, possibly we find there the lengthiest discourse where Jesus talks about many aspects of their spirituality. Beginning in verse number 2, he said that the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. That's a seat of judgment, a seat of leadership. So do and observe, now notice, what they tell you, but not the works they do. Why, Jesus? For they preach, but do not practice. Jesus said, now when it comes to religious authorities uh, in your world today, if you listen to what the Pharisees and scribes say, then you will be okay if you follow what they teach. But don't follow their example. There's the idea here of these individuals who are setting forth a standard for everyone else to follow, but they themselves are unwilling to follow that standard. That's what it means to preach but not practice. It means that, that I'm asking people to meet some type of ethic or moral standard in their life, but I'm not giving any attention to meeting that in my own life. We remember over in uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus would talk about hypocrisy in, in that particular setting as well. And you remember the first few words of Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and following, Do not judge that you be not judged. 
notice there, this kind of seems to be a really strange idea, but yet you, you kind of develop that further and you go to verse number 3 and you understand what type of judgment Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about judgment on, on the whole scale. Uh, righteous judgment, judgment that is good and, and proper according to the will of God, but he's talking about a certain type of, of judgment, if you will. What he says in verse number 3, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? <laughs> so Jesus draws this hypothetical situation where there's a, a brother trying to uh, pick, if you will, a bit of sawdust out of his brother's eye. <laughs> But yet at the same time, there's something much bigger than a speck in his own eye. There's a, there's a, a log, a massive of, uh, amount of material in his own eye. And he's trying to pick out that speck out of a, another individual's eye. That's the, the illustration Jesus gives. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye. When there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite. There's the word that we're talking about today. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You see, here is a brother who says, look, there's something wrong in your life, and, and we need to address that. You need to, to remove this issue from your life. But there is no willingness, none, to address the situation in his life. He's more interested in his brother's life than he is his own. And he's holding his brother up to a standard that he himself is unwilling to meet. That's the idea of hypocrisy. Preaching but, but not practicing. Now, of course, this is, when we look at Jesus' teachings, generally something seen with a lot of the religious rulers. But when you go over to Romans chapter 2, there's a broader discussion in the broader discussion in Romans 2, by inspiration, Paul is going to be dealing in this section of the book with the Jew-Gentile situation. Now, if you go to back to verse number 17 and following, what you're going to find is this. There are people among the Jews who consider themselves, and I'm going to say it like this, right with God. I am a God-fearing Jew under the law of Moses, and, and I have everything just right. I know what God's Word teaches. I'm familiar with it. I understand it. I'm well-versed in it. I know what God's will is in life, and I obey those things. I, I'm, I'm found faithful in His eyes. But not only am I very familiar with what God has taught me and what He leads me to do in this world, I believe that I am a light to other individuals. I am a guide, if you will, to those who are blind. And so what Paul does in, in the first few verses prior to the, the passage I've cited here is, is he talks about Jews who pride themselves on, on having God's will in their life and being able to spread that to other individuals. This is what he goes further and he asks, you then who teach others, do you teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, what do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, now notice what he says there, you boast in the law, it's where you hold your pride in life. I, I, I know the Word of God, and I do the Word of God in my life, and I boast in that, I have pride in that. You who boast in the law, you dishonor God by breaking the law. Now, when you look at this text, these are the people of God. And what Paul is saying is, this is what the world sees in you. The, the world sees you saying, well, this is what I'm supposed to be doing to please God, and, and, and here's the ideas that I follow in my life, and, and things of that nature. And by the way, you ought to do those same things, but there's a disconnect, there's a problem there. And the issue is, they're not doing those things. In fact, it's almost as if they have blatant disregard for what God says. And so what they do is they look at their neighbors who are unbelievers, the Gentiles of the world, and they say, you ought to be living like this. They're not giving any credence to that in their own life. They're, they're, not, they're not following the will of God. These are individuals who say, this is the way you should live, but they're not trying to live that way in their life. We can be that way as Christians today. 
we can be looking to the world saying, look, we have the truth of God's Word and, and, and we have the gospel and, and, and it's something that will bless your life and, and it's something that will lead you to a, a new and, and, and redeemed type of way of living. It's something that, that God will be pleased with you. But yet the world will notice if we don't live that way. If we're trying to set before the world this standard to live by, that we're, we're not willing to even attempt to follow ourselves. And so when we talk about hypocrisy being in our lives today, sometimes it can be manifested by the idea that says, I'm willing to preach to others. I'm willing to teach them, tell them how to live. But, but I'm not willing to practice what it is that I'm preaching and teaching. And, and folks, that's hypocritical. That's one of the, the ways hypo, hypocrisy can be seen in our life. Second thing is very close to that. I never coordinate uh, in my lessons with the prayers, the individual things that people say, but, but I believe that the two prayers, uh, uh, especially the, the, the opening prayer and the one led for the bread this morning, re reflects something that, that has to do with this particular subject. And that is, hypocrisy can be seen in our lives as Christians today. When we have an aversion, we, we refuse, if you will, to be honest about who it is that we are. Who it is that we are. I realize when I say this, I realize that it's a blanket statement. And I realize there are exceptions to, to what I'm about to say. But there are many people of the world who look at people who are Christians and they say, those folks believe that they're perfect. Now, I understand that, that sometimes that's just a statement made in ignorance, that, that they, they are individuals that don't know any Christians, really, and, and they ha kind of have seen things at surface level, and they really have not taken the time to get to know Christians and to, to visit with Christians and to know who they are and things of that nature. But their, their impression is, many times, is Christians believe that they are perfect. They believe that they're better than everyone else. Now again, some of that comes probably because of, of a misperception. It's, it, it's an uninformed view that the people of the world have because they don't really know Christians and they're just making a, a surface level judgment. But folks, sometimes this is a judgment that comes, a determination in someone's life because they do know some Christians. And because they have encountered some Christians who do act this particular way. I remember attending the services of the Lord's Church when I was a young person. And I remember thinking, walking into a service, boy, this is, this is different. When I'm around Christians, it's like everybody's great and wonderful and perfect and things of that nature. It's not this way when I walk into school. It's not this way when I walk into a business in town, so forth and so on. And, and in, in my mind, I said, man, everybody's got it together. Everybody's perfect. Everybody's righteous and, and always doing the right thing. I thought that as a young person. The truth of that, however, is not absolute, is it? You know, as we, we think about this concept, Jesus addressed this issue, I believe, in Luke chapter 18. He, he told a story because there were some who believed that they were righteous because of themselves. In other words, be, because of the things that they were doing. And he gave a story, he gave a parable, and there were two people illustrated in that parable. Notice the description of the first. The Pharisee, and they're in the temple praying here, standing by himself, prayed thus. Now listen to his prayer. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this second character in the story, tax collector, that is there praying with him that day. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Now, just look at these two verses and, and tell me what you see. Isn't there a lot of arrogance there? The first thing is, he's not going to associate with everyone else, and he's certainly not going to associate with the tax collector, but he's going to be by himself. There's almost the idea of exclusivity that we see here in this man's attitude. And then when he starts praying to God, notice, notice what he says. God... I thank you that I'm not like everybody else. <laughs> and then he starts giving a list of folks that were noted sinners in, in his day and time. You know, I, I'm thankful I'm not like this person, like that person. And, and even he's not ashamed, not in the very least to say, I'm not even like this guy praying in the temple with me today. There's a sense of arrogance here. 
God, I thank you that I'm not that person. There's conceit and arrogance in, in this man's heart. And then you wonder, why does he have this conceit? Well, you, you, you listen to what he says. Well, look at my deeds, God. The, the law of Moses says that, that I'm supposed to fast at certain times. But you know what? I go above and beyond that. I fast twice every week. And by the way, Jesus would say people that fasted like this, many of them in their society, in Matthew chapter 6, they'd do it in such a way that everybody else would notice it. And so we might say, this man says, I fast twice a week and everybody else around me, they know that. That's how holy and righteous I am. I give tithes of everything that I get. You see, in the law of Moses, there were ties for this and ties for that and, and those things. And, but yet, even when it came to the most minute and smallest of matters, this Pharisee says, I, I even give based on all of that. And in other words, I do better in this realm than any other folks among the Jews. <laughs> that's why I can pray this way, and that's why I can be this kind of person. Now, that's, a, that's an individual that is not in touch with who he really is. This is an individual whose pride and arrogance based on his deeds in life has neglected, if you will, has overlooked the importance of understanding what God has done in his life. Now Jesus takes this individual and he contrasts this to the second person in the story, the tax collector. Look at verse number 13, a very short snippet, if you will, compared to what we saw about the Pharisee, the tax collector standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. Who's he praying to? He's praying to God. He will not even look up to heaven to pray, which was a posture that many of the Jews would adopt as they were praying to God. He would not even look up to, to God in heaven, but instead he lowered his eyes. That tells us something right there. His posture says something. He beats his breast, which is a sign, if you will, of, of mourning and, 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 and it's something that, that shows that, that there's regret in this man's life. And what does he say? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Not a, I'm thankful, God, that I'm not like everybody else. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tax collector, but I'm not like every other tax collector. I'm here in the temple praying today. They're out taking advantage of people, betraying their country. No, he, he doesn't say any of those things. He just simply says, God, I need your mercy. Why? Because I'm a sinner. I want you to notice what Jesus says. I tell you, this man... The tax collector went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why, Jesus? For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Who are we like in the story? In terms of who people see us being, the way we act, the way we behave, the way we speak, things that people see in our lives, which one of these two are we most like? Are we more like the Pharisee or are we more like the tax collector? Being very open about who we are and honest about our, our place in life. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, and, and you kind of wonder when we think about this subject, why it came so early in the letter instead of maybe later. Maybe there was a really great need to emphasize this early in their reading. Notice verse number 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, verse 9, He is faithful and He's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice verse 10. He repeats again what He said back in verse number 8. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. Who is Him? That's God. And His Word is not in us. Twice... And I believe that's for the sake of emphasis. God tells us here, you need to be real about who you are. You need to be real about what need you have. You have a need, even as a child of God, to continue to be forgiven. I believe Tommy said it like this in that opening prayer. God, we continue to need your forgiveness in our life. Someone says, well, I don't want people to kind of put me in the... The, the, the category of, of people of the world. And, and, and understand the New Testament does call us saints. The, the New Testament calls us brethren. The New Testament says we're cleansed from our sins. The, the New Testament 
says we are different people. And, and the world may not understand that. And so someone might say, well, if I say what the tax collector said, then, then everybody will think I'm just like everyone else in the world that doesn't have Jesus Christ. And that's not right. Let me say something about that. Have you ever met an individual who is formerly an alcoholic? Individual that you got to know someone, I mean, and you started learning about him or her, and they shared with you, you know, look, I just want you to understand, I'm an alcoholic. You know, most of the time when you, when you learn that about somebody, they don't tell you, I'm an alcoholic. What they say is, I'm a what? I'm a recovering alcoholic. What does that mean? When someone says, I'm a recovering alcoholic, it means that, that I'm not perfect in this area of my life. I have struggled in the past with this addiction. It's something that's very real, and I struggle with it today. But when you use that term recovering, there's the implication that says, though that's who I used to be, this is what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to be better. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're not sinners in the same way that the world are sinners. What I mean by that is people of the world, they sin and they don't even care about their sin. It's not of significance to them. They don't think about it. It's not a priority in their life to deal with it. It's something that they participate in almost without thought, many of them. There's something different between that person and a child of God. But yet, I believe that we can say, though we are sinners, we are recovering sinners. We're trying to do better. We're going to still make mistakes. We're going to still need the mercy and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in our life. But we're recovering sinners. We're not perfect. The world looks at Christians sometimes and say, Christians, you believe you're perfect. You, you, you believe that, that you have everything together. That, that's not who we are. And if that's the persona we put forth, then the world would say, that's, that's hypocritical and that's correct. So when we talk about being honest about who we are, up front and open, we understand that, that if we're not, then we can be hypocritical in this way. A third idea that I would like to mention in the lesson that has to do with hypocrisy manifested in our lives today is what I'm going to just simply say, a feigned interest in truth, in truth. If you're a Christian, you should be interested in truth. It's that simple. You can't go to the pages of the New Testament without understanding what we believe, what we teach, what we practice. It's important. We don't have the authority given to us by God to make up the rules as we go, if you will. God has given to us His will for our life. We don't have the ability, God-granted ability, that is, with His approval, to modify what He has told us. Truth is important. You go over to Second John and Third John, and, and John will talk about the fact that, that his children walking in truth, that's the, that's the greatest thing that can be said about them in, in life. He would talk about it in Second John. He, he would talk about leaving the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the teachings and, and the things related to Jesus Christ and abandoning that for something else. And, 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 and when that happens, no longer do you have God and Jesus in your life, have that relationship with Him. That relationship has been broken. Truth is important. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Truth is important. But yet sometimes we want to pick and choose certain things even in certain subjects that we want to focus upon as truth, but we leave a lot of things out. Let me give you an example. In John chapter 5, verses 39 through 40, Jesus is speaking to some of the Jews. Again, they are people who are well-versed in the law of Moses. Look at what Jesus says. You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Is that good? Is that commendable? Yes. They, they wanted to know what God's Word said because they would say the way that I can go to heaven is found in this, in this book. It's found in the revealed Word of God. That's a commendable thing. That's something Jesus would, would very much pat them on the back for, 
But look at what he says further. And it is they, that is the Scriptures from the Old Testament, that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now isn't this ironic? Jesus said, you're very familiar with the law. You're very familiar with the prophets. And you know what they say. And you search them in hopes that you will be led to eternal life. You're, you're there for the right reason, and you're learning for the right reason. Your motivation is great. But yet the Scriptures which testify about me, which lead you directly to me, you draw the line and you say, no, I'm not going to go there. I, I, I believe in the law, I believe in the prophets, and I believe everything that God says, but I'm not going to quite go that far. These were individuals who would say, well, I want truth. I want what God's word says, but not all of it. Not all of it. And so they had, if you will, a feigned interest in truth, not a complete willingness to follow truth in their life. I want to use a couple of illustrations this morning. And if I step on toes, I apologize in advance. But yet I don't apologize. Because some of these things need to be said. There are a lot of people in this assembly and in every assembly where Christians gather this morning who will look at passages like Ephesians chapter 5, 19. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse number 15. And they will say and say it at the top of their lungs, we should be singing a cappella without the aid of instruments in our worship. Is that right? Is that good? Yes, we, we find that biblically. We find that in the worship of the New Testament, there was, were no instruments of music. That's an, something that man has brought in. That's something that's been added to what we do in our singing. We don't find it in the pages of the New Testament. But here's the question I want to ask. If we believe staunchly in that idea, because that's where the Scriptures lead us to, do we sing in an assembly like this morning? Or do we just stand by and watch everyone else sing? Because the same Scriptures that teach us that we should sing a cappella are the same Scriptures that tell us that we should be singing. That's a verb. That's something that involves action. I got a scratchy throat this morning, mouse dry. I brought some water with me this morning. Voice may give out. Sometimes you may see me not singing. And I understand that sometimes we have some hindrances to that occasionally where we can't sing at certain times. But I'm talking about the entire of our life. How many times do we come to an assembly like this, and as someone like Zane leads us in that first song, people around us are singing. But our mouth is shut, silent. Isn't that hypocritical? To say, I believe in truth, but to not be compelled to, to sing. Based on Acts chapter 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 and following, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, coupled with 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 and following, we believe that the Scriptures tell us to observe the Lord's Supper every single first day of the week that every time we gather together as a church, that we are to uh, participate in the Lord's Supper and that that keeps that forefront in our mind week after week after week, what Jesus did for us on the cross. And there will be folks that will stand and shout at the rooftops, yes, we're supposed to observe the Lord's Supper every single first day of the week, but yet what happens when it comes time to observe the Lord's Supper in service? Well, I think my lunch plans today include going to so-and-so and doing so-and-so. And you know this afternoon there's a lot of activities that I'm going to be planning. You know, I really did like that ball game last night. You know, the Braves won, Auburn won. Alabama's like, boy, it's been a good week. Do we really believe in truth? Or is really there just a feigned interest in it for certain aspects of it? You see, when we say that we're interested in truth. We're interested in everything. Not just a certain part of it or a certain aspect of it, but we're interested in the whole of it. And if we're interested in these other things, why aren't we interested in those as well? I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but in John chapter 4 and verse number 23, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, the hour is coming, now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. You know what Jesus didn't say here? He did not say, the Father is looking for folks that will stand and watch other folks worship. He's seeking people who will worship. That is a verb. And that means that when we assemble in a service like this and we have the elements of worship, people leading us in those elements, we should be participants in those. This is not a spectator activity, if you will. It's something that we should pour our hearts and our minds into. And if God Himself were in this assembly today, if Jesus were to come back to this earth today, and if He were here, when it came time to sing, would you be singing? That's something to think about. You know, there's something that you see in Revelation, the book of Revelation, several times. Praises are being said or sung to God. And what you find is an example like Revelation 5 and verse number 13, and that is the whole host of people are doing this. Here's the truth of the matter, folks. We get to heaven, we're going to be singing. We're going to be praising God. <laughs> what are we going to do when, when folks say, you know, it, it's time to praise God? I believe I'll sit over here in the corner. <laughs> not going to say a thing. I'm not going to sing a thing. Y'all just go ahead. Is that the way heaven's going to be? Why would God allow us to have an opportunity to praise Him in heaven if we're not willing to do that here on this earth? That's a good question we need to answer. We can be hypocritical in this way. We, we can say we have an interest in truth, but yet when our life is examined, that, that's not exactly going to be found. As we sum up our lesson today, hypocrisy, it's in the church. Hypocrisy can even be in, in our life today. And, and as we think about hypocrisy, if we preach but we don't practice, if we are not honest about who we are, and if we just have, a, a if you will, a, a feigned interest in truth but don't really practice the truth, then these are all forms of hypocrisy. And as we think about hypocrisy, it, it is as distasteful today to God and Jesus as it was in the first century. I want to end this morning with an illustration. Some folks saw me bringing this in, and they wondered what I was going to do. All right, I've got a cooler that I'm holding up in front of you, okay? It's just an average cooler. I don't know how old it is. I don't know how new it is, whatever. All right, so suppose with this cooler, I tell you, <laughs> You know, I smoked uh, about three or four Boston butts about a month ago, and when I pulled them off the grill, I put them in that cooler. An hour later, I pulled them out and started pulling them and preparing them and everything, but I kind of left everything else there. That was a month ago. And I hadn't cleaned that out. For those of you that have grilled before, what do you think about that? You want what's inside that cooler? Mm -mm. All right, I'm not a fisherman, okay? Uh, there, there are several. I was asking Damon a little earlier about fish. I said, is it, is it common sometimes when you go fishing that you, you catch some fish, you clean some fish, and maybe in a cooler you, you put some heads and skins and things like that, bones in there, and sometimes maybe you, you, you throw out that stuff, but you forget to clean it out afterwards? He said, oh, yeah, that happens. And he says, sometimes you forget to take the stuff out. And he says, sometimes you even forget to get the fish out and clean them. I said, how's that after about a month? He said, you want to bury the cooler. You don't want to have anything to do with it. I want you to understand that if that's the way this cooler is, there's not a single person in this auditorium who wants to take it home. Nobody. It's distasteful. It, it, it is something that if you open up that cooler, just the mere sight, the mere smell, it, it, it is repulsive in every form. That's what happens to us as Christians in the world when we're hypocrites. That's exactly how the world reacts when they see hypocrisy in us. I mentioned to you a few moments ago, Romans chapter 2, verses 21 through 23, where these people who thought they were the salt of the earth, the, the, the hard question is given, do you practice what you preach? We did not go to verse number 24, but this is how it ends. 
For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The world, the Gentile world looks at you and because you don't practice what you preach. Because of your hypocrisy, the world says, I want nothing to do with what you represent. As repulsive as that cooler would be in the circumstances that I described, that's how repulsive our life is to the world if we're hypocrites. We need, simply put, to work on this in our life. We need to start erasing in our lives because it's not just about us. We'll lose our soul. But it's about the cause of Jesus Christ being hindered. It's about people of this world saying, I want no part in the one who gave everything for me because of his people. Folks, we'll be judged for that. It's a very serious matter. And we need to address hypocrisy in our lives, in the church, however it appears. We need to address that. And we need to make sure we're striving to live the way God wants us to live. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we would encourage you to obey the gospel through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. If you're a Christian and there are things that you need to repent of, whether it's things associated with our study today or something else, we beg you, we ask you to address that in your life. If you need our help, we'd ask us to pray with you and for you about those things. We're happy and willing to do that. But today, if there's things that are missing in our life, we need to make some changes. And if we can help you with those, we hope you'll come. While together we stand and sing the song of encouragement. Hear you not the invitation? Oh, prepare to meet thy God, careless souls. Oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment. Again, thanks for being with us today, especially if you're a guest of ours. And again, we remind you, if you're joining us online, we apologize for the issues we've had with our internet service today and the ability to stream as normal, but we hope that everyone will join us uh, next Sunday morning as we uh, meet once again to worship our Heavenly Father. Continue to remember all those who need our prayers. Uh, remember a number of other announcements. Uh, remember that next uh, weekend is the uh, ending of daylight savings time, so we'll set our clocks back one hour if we use those manual clocks. Also, you'll notice in the bulletin today that in the past few weeks, there's been a donation made by the Congregation for Disaster Relief in LaPlace, Louisiana, and we appreciate uh, the opportunities that we've had to help out those who have fallen on hard times due to many different uh, natural disasters in recent weeks. Also want to remind everybody that today being a fifth Sunday is a different type of schedule that we have. Our evening service will be at 2 p.m. And so at 2 p.m. we'll come into the auditorium. Our young men will lead us in our services. And uh, Jordan's going to come uh, mention a few things that we'll be doing after that. All right. Well, uh, good morning. 
Uh, like Carrie said, uh, we're going to be having our, our young men service there at uh, 2 o'clock. And so if you have a uh, young man that would like to participate in that and you haven't gotten with me already on that, please go ahead and do so just immediately following services here. Uh, we can get them plugged in and, and get them to participate in that. We'd love to have them uh, be a part of that with us. At 145, if you uh, have food that's going to, to be a part of the event, uh, we ask that you bring that here, uh, bring it down there where the basketball goal is. There'll be somebody there that can take your food where it needs to be and, and go and all those kinds of things. Uh, so if you'll have that here at 145, uh, we'll make sure that that gets to where it, it needs to go. Um, if you will, uh, there at 2 o'clock, uh, after uh, services are over, what we'll do there is everybody will finish up. We'll give everybody just a minute to go and change, do those things. Uh, utilize uh, whichever room, 15 minutes or so, uh, get the kids dressed, and then all the adults, what they'll do is, is go outside, similar to what you would do, uh, I guess, at a, at a wedding, stand outside, kind of make an aisle on both sides, and we'll do a uh, costume uh, parade there, and so the kids will, will go out and we'll have the cars lined up for the uh, trunk or treat, They'll be lined up at the, uh, the annex side, so lined up on the, the wood line, kind of. So you'll line up the annex side and go alongside towards um, the, the back that way. Uh, so do that for us if you can, and then we'll go from left to right down towards the, uh, the pavilion, and we'll start just like that with the, uh, the trunk or treat there uh, just right after. Uh, so if you'll, you'll do that for us, help us out, parents, with that. Uh, that should be a, a good time for them, um, and, and park and just have your trunks ready, all those good things. Uh, then after the, uh, the trunk or treat, what we'll do is you'll see many stations, all those things kind of set up, ready to go for you. Uh, you'll see a, a bounce house slide, those types of things. People will be there to help you out, guide you, show you what to do. Uh, so you'll, you'll be able to participate, do those things, and uh, just go and, and kind of go wild and, and have a good time. So uh, feel free to, to go and participate, do those things, and then just kind of uh, eat as you uh, feel like you, you would like to. Uh, that's pretty much how the, the order of uh, events and, and things will go. We're really excited about it. Uh, if you have any other questions moving forward, just please let us know. But again, there at 2 o'clock, we'll get started. We'll, we'll have services, uh, just depending on how long our, our guys take. Uh, to do that, to go through, uh, then just as soon as that's over, we'll we'll get started with the uh, the activities for the afternoon. Thank you. I'd like to stay here longer than men's allotted days and watch the plea changes of my son even. But if my Savior calls me to the sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing a story there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, the more to Please bow with me. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we've gathered today on this beautiful day that you've given us to, to worship you, to praise your name, to lift songs up, to lift prayers up, 
to learn lessons about you, Lord, and we pray that you will we pray that you will accept what we've done and that it has been acceptable to you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the lesson from Carrie. While we know we're all sinners, Lord, we pray that we'll be recovering sinners and not seen as hypocrites. Lord, be with those that couldn't be with us today because of health or because of attitude or other conditions. Pray that you'll have them return to us when they can. Lord, be with those that have lost loved ones and comfort them as only you can. Lord, be with us until our next appointed time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.